Julian Assange is not your average journalist or publisher, and some have argued that he's not really a journalist at all. He is an anti-establishment ideologue with conspiratorial views. He believes large government institutions use secrecy to suppress the truth, and he distrusts the mainstream media for playing along. Some people have called him an anarchist, which he denies. Assange prefers to be called a libertarian and believes that the only people who can adequately police the system are those on the inside who are in a position to notice the abuse and blow the whistle. While most reporters pride themselves in gathering information and interpreting it for a larger audience, the WikiLeaks model is different. It prefers to take raw data, make it available, and let others decide the meaning. Regardless of whether you agree with this idea or not, it beats close to the heart of the Internet and a younger generation, and it runs through the life of Julian Assange. The story will continue in a moment. You obviously have a mistrust of authority. Um, where does that come from? So I think it comes from experience um, with various types of authorities. But Assange gave us an example from his childhood, a story about him and his mother, Christine, who was present at one of his recent court hearings. She was a political activist who helped scientists gather information about nuclear tests conducted by the British in the Australian outback. He remembers them being stopped late one night in question by authorities, one of whom said, Look, lady, you're out at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, with his child. Uh, I, it could be suggested you're unfit, mother. Uh, I suggest you stay out of politics, uh, and which he did for the, for the next 10 years in order to make sure uh, nothing happened to me. So that's a, a, a very early abuse um, of power and of secrecy uh, that I saw in my life. His was an unconventional and sometimes tumultuous childhood. He was frequently uprooted and moved around the countryside and attended 37 different schools. So you've always been a little bit of an outsider. I've certainly, when I was a child, going from one school to another, uh, you are the outsider to begin with and you have to find uh, your way in. Uh, but in most of the places where I, where I stayed um, for long enough, I did find my way in. One of the first places Assange found his way into was populated by teenagers and computers, and he knew how to program them before most people had them. You got involved with computers pretty early, with hacking. Well, I first became involved with computers when I was 13 or so, and I was unusually adept. I saw a sort of uh, intellectual opportunity, understanding how to program and understanding how these complex machines work. And that was part of a, a social culture in um, uh, cracking uh, codes to prove that you could do it. It's very actually normal and, and healthy amongst young men. Uh, you see it in skateboarders, that are competing to show um, that they are capable in learning the best tricks. And your tricks were like breaking into computers at the Department of Defense and Los Alamos National Laboratory, NASA, Nortel, some Canadian yeah. banks. All, all, that, all that happened. At age 20, Assange was arrested by the Australian Federal Police and eventually pled guilty to multiple counts of computer hacking. He managed to get off with no jail time because the judge concluded that he hadn't stolen any information or done any damage. Is that still one of your primary skills? Not really. Unfortunately, I've been sort of, you know, promoted up uh, into management, so I don't get to do uh, don't get to do that so much. But I know the terrain, which means I know what is possible. For example, Bill Gates could program, but he certainly doesn't program anymore. But he knows what is possible for other people to do. Except that Assange is not Bill Gates and WikiLeaks is not Microsoft. The shoestring operation that created all the havoc has no permanent offices and is headquartered wherever Assange happens to be. WikiLeaks is a small non-profit organization with a handful of employees, a secret cadre of international programmers, and a legion of worldwide volunteers. Its finances are administered by the Val Holland Foundation, based in Berlin and named after a famous hacker. According to its ledgers, WikiLeaks took in $1.3 million last year in donations with expenses of about $500,000. For somebody who abhors secrets, you run a pretty secret organization. That's not true. What we want 
this transparent government, not transparent people. We are an organization who, one of our, our primary goals is to keep certain things secret, to keep the identities of sources secret. Secrecy is an inherent part uh, of our operation. The State Department would make the same argument. They have doing very sensitive work that they're trying to make peace and negotiate situations around the world very delicately. It's important that they do this in secrecy. What's the difference? And we don't say that the State Department should have no secrets. That's not what we say. Rather, we say that if there are people in the State Department who say that there is some abuse going on, and there's not a proper mechanism for internal accountability um, and external accountability, they must have a conduit to get that out to the public. And we are the conduit. Given all the attention that Assange has received, we were curious about how he thought he was being perceived in the United States. He told us he hasn't had the time to give it much thought. Do you want me to give you my characterization of what I think people think? Sure. Mysterious, little, little weird, a cult-like figure, a um, little paranoid. Well, um, you're, you're, you're repeating all the, the ad hominem attacks by our critics. My role when I do something like speak about that we have discovered the deaths of 109,000 individual people in Iraq, 15,000 civilian casualties never before reported uh, anywhere. That's a very serious role. That is not a role where I can uh, engage in humour. So I'm not used to uh, performing under the spotlight, and I'm learning this as, as time is going by. You have shown a fair amount of contempt for the mainstream press over the years. Why did you decide to, as you use the word, partner with them in some of these most recent releases? We're a small organization. We're in a position, say, with Cablegate, where we have 3,000 volumes of material that are very important to get out to the public in a responsible manner, that have the potential for great change. For example, this recent revolution in Tunisia. It is logistically impossible. So instead, our organization delegates its excess source material to other journalists who will have more impact and will, who, do, who will do a better job. There is an element of the press, most of the mainstream press, Nobody wants to see you prosecuted because it could affect the way that they do their business. But there's also a feeling within the community that you're not one of them, um, that, you, that you play a different game. We do play a different game, uh, and I hope we're a new way. The point that they're making, I think, is that you're, not a, you're, 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 you're a publisher, but you're also an activist. Um, we, well, we're, we're a particular type of activist. In the U.S. context, there seems to be a communist activists or something. So it's right, a, agitator. It's a, it's Somebody a, it's who's a dirty, more interested in... It's a dirty word in the it's U.S. It's a dirty word. And people think that what you're trying yeah. to do is to um, we, we, sabotage the workings of government. No, we're not that type of activists. We are free press activists. It's not about saving the whales. It's about giving people the information they need to support whaling or not support whaling. Why? That is the raw ingredients that is needed to make a just and civil society. And without that, you're just sailing in the dark. There have been clear signs that Assange, under the threat of possible indictment by the Justice Department, has moderated some of his views. Before releasing the last two batches of classified documents, Assange and his lawyers contacted both the Pentagon and the State Department, offering to explore ways to minimize potential harm. In both cases, their offer was rebuffed. Assange acknowledged that his fundraising has been hurt by the decision of PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, and Bank of America to cease handling donations but he dismissed reports that WikiLeaks is racked by internal dissension and mass defections. We're talking about uh, Daniel Dumscheit-Berg, who was a German spokesperson, had a limited role in the organization. We had to uh, suspend him uh, some five months ago. He describes you as being authoritarian, secretive, punitive. I'm the boss that suspended him, that's correct. 
You don't care to elaborate? I think I just did. <laughs> you said you had this package of very damaging uh, uh, documents that is sort of a poison pill that's going to be released if anything bad happens to you. No, that's not, a, that's not at all true. That's, that's some kind of media hype. Um, what we do have is a system whereby we distribute encrypted backups of things we have yet to publish. There are backups distributed amongst many, many people, 100,000 people, uh, and that all we need to do is give them an encrypted key and they will be able to continue on. This wasn't intended to be a blackmail threat? Not at all. What would trigger that encryption code being Anything released? that prevented us from our ability to publish. So not just for a second, but prevented us significantly from being able to publish. Your imprisonment, for example. If a number of people uh, were imprisoned uh, or assassinated, uh, then we would feel that we could not go on uh, and that other people would have to take over our work and we would release those keys. One bank, Bank of America, had its stock go down three to five percent based on a, on, on a rumor, maybe it's a rumor, maybe you know more about it, that you had uh, the contents of a five gigabyte hard drive belonging to one of its executives. Do you have a five gigabyte hard drive? I won't make any comment in, in relation to uh, that upcoming publication. You're certainly not denying it. Well, we're not, to, you know, there'd be a process of elimination if, um, if we denied some and admitted others. So it might not be Bank of America and you're just going to let them squirm until you get ready to... I, uh, I think it's great. We have all these banks squirming, thinking maybe it's them. You seem to enjoy stirring things up. Well, when, when you see abusive organisations uh, suffer the consequences as a result of their abuse and you see victims elevated, uh, it's, yes, that's a very pleasurable uh, activity to be involved in. I mean, you see yourself as a check on the power of the United States and other big countries in the world. And in the process of doing that, you have now become powerful yourself. Who is the check on you? It is our sources who choose to provide us with information or not, depending on how they see our actions. It is our donors who choose to give us money or not. This organization cannot survive for more than a few months without the ongoing support of the public. Go to 60minutesovertime.com to hear how the Julian Assange WikiLeaks story almost never happened. Sponsored by Lipitor.